will sometimes allow you to go through some stuff. And I'm talking about myself. I went through something really, really hard, and I didn't even know what it was until he brought me out of it. But I survived, and I'm able to share it with you. So I'm going to describe this place, because one thing that I do understand, I'm not the only one. It's all of our journey. At some point in time, we will end up in this place. If you stick with the Lord long enough, you will end up in this place. It's a desolate place. It's a dry place. It's a place of void where you feel disconnected, where God feels so far away, where he feels unresponsive. No matter how much you pray, it feels like your prayers are hitting a wall. Your faith, you feel doubtful. You feel like, what am I doing all of this for? Why did, I didn't sign up for this part of it. And it seems like God has abandoned you. And it feels like God has ghosted you. That's a, a, a new term. That God just went blank. That God put us on mute. Well, that place is called the wilderness. And I didn't know it was a place that Christians go until I actually came out of it. I knew I was in a place, but I didn't know what it was. But I made it out so I could share it with you. So if you're there now, and when you get there, because it is all a part of our journey, you'll understand where you are and how to survive it. So I wanna share two um, passages of scripture with you. So meet me in the book of Deuteronomy chapter eight, You can stand for the reading of the word. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. And it says, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what's in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or not. He humbled you, and he let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that, that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord. And then I want to go to um, Matthew chapter 4. starting at verse 1. And that's Matthew 4, starting at verse 1. And it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into a holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they shall bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to, te to the test. And the devil took him again to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you, f if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and to, began to minister to him. And I wanted to, you may have a seat. I wanted to read both of those wilderness experiences because although we all go through it, we all don't go through it the same way. 
as you see in scripture. And I'm going to kind of share some of the things that, that I learned from both experiences. Because if you're not, if you're not, let me see how, how I can put it. If you don't understand where you are, it's harder for you to get through it. So if you know where you are, then you, you're more able to get through to the other side. So I want to share um, from my message, don't die in the wilderness. And I want to share some survival rules, things you need to, go, need to know to get to the other side. Amen? Amen? And one of the first things that we all need to know about this wilderness season, and it's in both passages of scripture, that is God initiated. God initiated the wilderness season. Because it says, all the years I led you. And it said in the passage that we read about Jesus' wilderness season, it said, and he was led by the Holy Spirit. And there's another version that actually says he was driven, which means it wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't nothing that he signed up for. It, he was driven to. It's like, come on, get the car. This is where we're going. So it is God initiated. It's not because of sin. It's not because you did something wrong. It is a part of your journey and is led by the Holy Spirit. It is somewhere where you have to go. But God also designed the wilderness season for you to get to the other side. It is not a place for you to live in. It is a place to be journeyed through. Amen? But as we look at the story, and the story of um, the Israelites, that's who Moses was talking to in, in the story in Deuteronomy. If you look at their story, it says um, back in Exodus, and, and it's God talking to Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go, that they may journey three days to the wilderness to worship. So God designed it for them to go through the wilderness. It was a part of their journey, but he designed it for a specific purpose, and it was to worship. But when you look at the story of the Israelites, they got to the wilderness, but they didn't worship. They murmured and grumbled and complained. So that's one of the first things that I want to share with you, a survival tool, is watch your mouth. Watch your mouth in the wilderness. Because what you say out of your mouth will determine and dictate how long you stay there. Because they were only to go into the wilderness three days and then journey on to the promised land. But they didn't because they murmured and they grumbled and they complained. So you got to watch what you say out of your mouth. One of the things that I didn't realize, that, and, and I'm looking back in hindsight, that some of the things that, that I said, I shouldn't have been saying while I was in my wilderness season. And a, a covenant sister of mine, I remember her saying to me, stop saying that. Because I kept saying, I'm so confused, I'm so confused, I'm so confused. Well, the more I said it, the more confused I got. <laughs> so I had to watch what I was saying out of my mouth. And I had to get into agreement with what the word says. Because when you complain and murmur and grumble in your wilderness season, you're coming in agreement with the enemy and not in agreement with God. Because it was God initiated. So while you're there, one of the things that I had to learn to do was line my mouth up with the word and to say what God said and not what I felt. Because they were murmuring and complaining because they was hungry. They was hungry. They was angry and they was hungry at the same time. So they started murmuring and, and complaining. And one thing I want to make clear, it's nothing wrong with you laying out your complaint to God. In Psalms 142.2, it said, Paul says, and I laid out my complaint to God. But there's a big difference between laying out your complaint and complaining about God. They were complaining about God. And when you read the story, they were saying things like, why did you bring us out here to kill us? Why did you bring us out here to this, this desert land where there's no water? Where are we going to get water from? Now, this is the same God that took the water and heaped it up, that they walked out on dry land. So if you think that God could do that, you don't think that he could give you water? So if he wanted to kill you, he would have drowned you in the same sea that he drowned your enemies in, that you watched wash ashore. So sometimes we forget 
And that's why it's important to, to map milestones in our journey with God when God has done something for us. Because we forget easy. God could have just done something miraculous in your life where it was nobody but God. You know it wasn't nobody but God. Everybody know it wasn't nobody but God that could have delivered you from that thing. And then as soon as, and, and you praise him. You give him glory, you give him praise, because they praised him and they believed him when, they deliver, when he delivered them out of, the, out of the bondage that they were in. But as soon as it got hard, they start murmuring and grumbling and complaining. Now, nowhere in, in the scripture where God spoke to Moses to speak to the people of Israel, where he said that when I bring you out, it's going to be easy. He didn't say that. He said, he didn't say, when I bring you out, there's not going to be no hard times. So sometimes we forget that just because God promised us something doesn't mean it's going to be easy to get there. I can guarantee you it's not going to be easy because we have an enemy, we have an adversary who's going to come for what God has said that he's going to bless you. He can't take it from you, but his goal is to make you give it up. And how we give it up is with our mouths. What are you saying out of your mouth over your situation? Are you coming into agreement with God or are you coming into agreement with the enemy? So the first thing that you need to survive the wilderness, to survive, to, is to watch your mouth. Because it will dictate how long you stay in it and if you get through it. Because some of those who came out of the, the, the bondage died. They died in the wilderness because they would not yield to the Lord. They would not believe him. So they died. So I say to you, watch your mouth so you can get through it because it's God's desire for you to get to the other side. Amen? Amen. And the next thing you need to know is who you are. Sometimes we don't know who we are, but the enemy does. And we, we look at, at the scripture where um, where Jesus was in the wilderness, the first thing that the enemy said to him, the first line of attack was, if you are the son of God. And he said it twice. So it's not that the enemy didn't know. He, he knew exactly who he was. He saw and he heard when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the sky opened up and, and God spoke. This is my son whom I'm well pleased. So God has said the same thing about you. These are my sons and daughters, who I'm well pleased. He said it about Israel. He said to Israel, you are my son. And he killed um, the Pharisees, the Egyptians' first sons, because he would not let his son go. So the enemy knows exactly who you are. That's why the attack against who you are is so hard. So that's why the enemy is telling you, you can't do it. You ain't got enough. You can't do it. You don't have no money. You can't do it. You're not smart enough. But God already told you to do it. And if God called you to it, he already equipped you to do it. So if you don't line your mouth up, and if you decide to, to stand in who you are, which God declared you to be, then you can walk in the thing that God called you to. Because when... Israel got to the place where they were getting ready to go into the promised land. It was their suggestion that they send 10 spy, 12 spies to go and spy out the land. But 10 brought a bad report back, and 2 brought a good report back. And one of the things that they said that I thought was so profound, well, really stupid, is they said, we are grasshoppers in our eyes. And because we're grasshopper and look like grasshoppers in our eyes, that's how we look to them. So they line, they line their whole being up with the enemy. But that's not who God called them. God said, I called you to be holy. I've called you to be priests to me. And God calls you to be holy. 
And we are a holy nation. So stop lining your thoughts and your mind and your mouth with what the enemy says. Because that's how they died in the wilderness. Because the thing that they said out of their mouths, and they murmured and they grumbled and complained against God. And they, this is what they said. You, and they're talking about God. You brought us out here to kill us, to kill our wives and our children, that they may become victims. And because of that, God punished them that they would not just stay in the wilderness, but they would stay in the wilderness for 40 years, and that a whole generation died. A whole generation had to die, and those that they said would be victims had to grow up that they would inherit the promised land. So either you're going to be promised land people or victims but the choice is yours. So the first one, we, we said we had to watch our mouths. Secondly, we have to know who we are. And one of the things that Israel had that we have to watch is don't have unhealthy patterns. What do I mean by that? One minute they believed, as long as they saw the glory of God, as long as they saw God blessing them, they believed God. But as soon as it got hard, as soon as they didn't have something readily at their fingertips, they complained about God. So either you're going to believe God or not. Nah. It can't be both. Either you're going to believe him when it's all good, or you, and you're going to still believe him when it doesn't seem that it's all good. Because even though it's hard, even though things bad are happening, God is still good. Our circumstances is not predicated, our, I'm sorry, our, his goodness is not predicated on our circumstances. But if we're not careful, we'll be just like Israel. As long as things are good, as long as I can see the blessing, as long as I can see that my bills are paid, as long as I can see my kids acting right, as long as my husband acting right, as long as I got a boo, as long as everything is everything, then I'm going to give God praise. But the moment that something doesn't happen, we complain about God. What we should be doing is laying out our complaint to God. Because they saw God's mighty hand. It was by a mighty hand that he brought them out from, from bondage. It wasn't, he didn't just say, come on, I'm going to take you. He, it was specific things that he did so they would know who he was. That he was mightier than all of the other little gods in Egypt. Each plague lined up with a god that Egypt worshipped. And because... Israel had lived there for over 400 years. They knew who these gods were. So when they saw him do it, and one of the things that he did that was, that you, you got to go and read the story from Exodus all the way to Deuteronomy. Some parts you, when he gives the law, you can skip over that and just read some of the things that he did and how he did it before them. But one of the things he did in Egypt is that because he did 10 plagues, and I think it may be around the fifth one, I'm not, I'm not sure, but he started to make a difference. One of the things he did is he, he said, I'm going to make it dark for three days. And in Egypt, it was dark for three days, but where the Israelites lived, it was light. So God started to make a difference. So he did things like that. Their cattle died. None of the Israelites' cattle died. When he did the last plague, their son, their firstborn sons died. Israel's sons did not die. So he made it clear that he was the one and only true God. Because there were many pagan gods. And if Israel had stayed in that pagan land, those were the gods that they were serving. So he did it specifically so they would know that it was he, the one and true God that brought them out of bondage. So he, he made it so that they would know. But when they got to the places where it got hard, they forgot. 
And one of the things that you'll see when you read it is he kept saying the same thing over and over. Don't forget me. Don't go and worship other gods. Don't put no other gods before me. Because he know how we are. We're sheep. We forget. As soon as something bad happened, we forgot get all the good things that God has already done. We forget that he the same God. The same God that, that raised up the water. The same God that hit the rock and water came out. The same God. The same God that delivered you from whatever you were into. He's the same God. Even though bad things may be happening. But sometimes we forget. And because they forgot, some of them died. Because they forgot, their extended stay was 40 years. That was only meant to be three. So I want to encourage you, don't extend your stay. It's not designed for you to stay. It's designed for you to get what you need to go into the promised land. But you dictate how long you're going to be there and if you're going to survive. So watch your mouth. Know who you are. Don't have unhealthy patterns. Don't believe God one minute and then as soon as something bad happens, you forget. That's the time you need to really worship God. Because the, one, of the, one of the first reasons that he wanted them to go into the wilderness was to worship. Not complain in their circumstances. So stop complaining about your circumstances and start worshiping. Because worship is a weapon. So pull out your weapons of war and start worshiping. Amen? One of the other things that I want to share is don't allow your emotions to be your guiding factor. Our feelings are real, but they're not truth. They are facts, and they change all the time. Before you got here, you felt a certain way. Now that you're here, you feel a certain way, and when you leave, you're going to feel another way. Which one of those is true? None of them. Don't allow your emotions to dictate what's true. Always line them up with the word of God. When I was in the wilderness, I felt like God was so far away. Like God had abandoned me. I felt like my prayers were hitting a wall. Like I was praying and nothing was happening. I felt numb. But I had to remember, well, what's true? Well, what's true is God has not forsaken me. God has not left me. God will never leave me. That's the word. That's what's true. So when you're going through something and your emotions are real, I'm not going to tell you that, you know, you can control how you feel, but you can control how you act in your feelings. The word says, and it's somewhere in Psalms, that we have the power of self-control in the day of adversity. So you can control your emotions. You can calm yourself down. That's one of the things that Moses said to the children of Israel. Stand still, be calm, and see the salvation of the Lord. So we can calm ourselves down. We can stand still, and we can see the salvation of the Lord in our circumstances. So don't let your emotions rule you. If you. Don't be like a city with its walls torn down, where anything can come in and rule it. The only thing we should be ruled by is the Holy Spirit. So don't let what's happening to you get in you. It's just something that's happening. It's called life. And all of us are going to experience life. And God never told us that life will be easy. He said, in this life you shall have trials and tribulations. But be of good courage. I've overcome the world and its power to harm you. So watch your mouth. 
Know who you are. Don't have unhealthy patterns. Don't allow your emotions to dictate. And one of the things that I wanted to, to share is that he did all of this for, with the wilderness season. And in our lives, he does, he allows us to go to the wilderness season for a specific purpose. And we read it in Deuteronomy 8. It's to humble us, to test us, to know what's in our hearts, if we will obey God or not. To humble us, to test us, to know what's in our hearts, whether we will obey God or not. Because if you won't obey God in the wilderness, you will not obey him in the promised land. Sometimes we think that you know, if I just hit the lottery, I'll tie. If you ain't tithing now, you ain't going to tithe when you get your hands on that much money. If you're not worshiping now, you're not going to worship then. If you're not obeying now, you're not going to obey then. Your wilderness season is important. And how we all arrive there is different. With me, it was when I, I got sick. I had never been sick before, ever, outside of common cold and having babies. I'd never been in a hospital. That was a wilderness season for me. And because I had never been sick, I never had to believe God for healing. So I had to adjust my mouth, get my emotions in check, and come into agreement with God that God is a healer. And if he allowed it to happen, he already had the antidote to heal me. But I had to believe it. I had to get out of my own way and believe, even though I didn't know where I was, I had to stop saying I didn't know where I was. Because even though I didn't know, he knew. And I had to remember he cares for me. He knows me. He knows everything about me. And yet he allowed this thing to happen. So I had to change my questions. God, why are you allowing this? What is this for? What is the purpose? What do you want me to do in this? And I had to listen. Even though I, I couldn't hear God, I couldn't see God, I couldn't feel God, God wanted me to get my emotions out of the way. That had nothing to do with how I felt, had nothing to do with what I saw, had nothing to do with what the doctor said, because they gave a report, but I had to choose to, to believe the report of the Lord. So I had to watch my mouth and know who I am. That I am the healed of God. It is not the will of God for us to be sick. So I had to come into agreement with what the word was saying. And what the word has said, he already said that by his stripes, I am healed. Not that I might be not one day, it might happen. It's all, I, I'm, I'm already healed, even if the report doesn't line up with what the, what the word says. So even if your life at this time is not lining up with what God said, remember what he said. Because God is a promise maker, and he's a promise keeper. So if he said it, he going to do it. God is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he shall repent. If he said it, he going to make it good. And I can tell you right now, when I first got sick and they ran my numbers, I, I, had, I was diagnosed with a thyroid condition. Notice I, I didn't say I have a thyroid condition. I was diagnosed with a thyroid condition. And they, take your, they do these tests where they take my numbers. My numbers started at a nine... I think it's 921. Now, today, it's at a 5.5. One of the numbers was at, I think, like a 6-something. Now, it's at a 2.61. So God has, has already declared my healing. The numbers are just starting to line up with what he declared. Because I will never concede that I have anything that has no right 
to be in my body. Amen? Amen. So one of the things that, that, that I had to do, like I said, was watch my mouth, know who I am, don't have unhealthy patterns, and know, now I know why I was in that place. For God to humble me, to test me, to know what was in my heart. It's not that God didn't know. And it's not that you don't know, that God doesn't know, it's that we don't know what's in our hearts. Because Israel didn't know that they were so ungrateful and that they were, <laughs> they were so stubborn. God called them stiff necked which means stubborn, that they were so stubborn in their ways. They didn't know that about themselves until they were tested in it. So what you're going through is only a test to see what's in your heart and if you will choose to obey God in it, even when it's hard. And it was hard because I had never been in that place before. I never had to believe God at that level. I've always been a woman of great faith. I believe God for everything. But I had to choose him. I choose to believe something I never had to believe before. I could believe it for you. I could pray for your healing. But I had never been in that position before. So I had to remember that he was the same God. He was the same God that saved my house from foreclosure. He was the same God that saved my children from being fools. He's the same God. So what God is doing in the wilderness, your wilderness season may be a financial issue. It may be a loss of a loved one. Whatever it is, God is testing you. He's humbling you to see what's in your heart, if you will obey him or not. And what you do in the wilderness will dictate how long you're going to be there if you're going to die in it, or if you're going to make it to the promised land. And one other thing I want to share is it has nothing to do with sin. You're not being punished. You're being processed. It has nothing to do with sin. You're not being punished. You're being processed. And I know I had to say that because some people in here are in the wilderness and they feel like, God, I, I was doing everything you told me to do. Why is this happening? Did I do something wrong? You're not being punished. You're being processed. So even though Israel failed miserably, they still went into the promised land because it was a promise that God made to their forefathers. So God will still get you to the promised land because it's his promise that he made to you. But how you get there will solely depend on you. But I want to leave you with good news. And the reason why I read the other scripture about Jesus in the wilderness is that everywhere Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. So if Jesus succeeded, he's our example that we can make it out. We can make it out without lingering in it and without dying in it. And how he made it out is everywhere the enemy challenged him, he spoke the word. It is written. It is written. Do you know the word? Because if you don't know any word, you can't say it's written. Because the devil ain't moved by you screaming. He ain't moved by your temper tantrums. He's not moved by anything except for the word of God. So Jesus is our firm foundation, our firm example. And it's no happenstance that every scripture that he quoted was, was from Deuteronomy. So everywhere that Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. So you can succeed in your wilderness season. And one of the things that, 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 um, that the devil attacked him in was the last that I want to bring out is the last thing that he said to Jesus is if you worship me I'll give you the kingdom but there's no kingdom without the cross there's no promised land without the wilderness you have to go through the wilderness 
to get to the promised land. So don't abort it. Don't try to go around it. Don't try to go over it, but go through it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, God may seem far away. It may seem like God's not answering. But one of the things that happens when you take the test is that the master is silent. So as you have enough, you have the word in you. God already prepared it for you. He prepared the way to get to the other side. But how you get there successfully are those survival rules. Watch your mouth. Know who you are. Don't have unhealthy patterns. Don't let your emotions dictate. You're not being punished. You're being processed. Amen. And we can get to the other side. I'm here as a survivor. We can get to the other side. Amen.